Good day, everyone. This is Pondleaf Needles, and welcome to DDO Players News, where we take a look at the latest news in DDO and on the tabletop. And please welcome my co host from Ravenloft, Dracula. Hey now, everybody. How's it going? Hello, Drac. How are things going over in Barovia? Mm, same crap, different day, as they say. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Sort of happens that way. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm used to it by now, so it's okay. <laughs> okay. Let's then head into our game news, where the first thing is about nerfing content into the ground. What's that all about? Right, we're going to nerf content into the ground, Pine Leap. They're nerfing everything. Nerfing everything? Everything. Well, okay, not quite everything. No, this was a very funny name for this thread. Flimsy Firewood put this uh, over in the forums, and he did. He, he entitled the thread, Nerfing Content into the Ground. <laughs> Flimsy says, hey, folks, we have been looking at interesting data about player deaths in the hardcore server. There are a few quests that spike above and beyond the difficulty curved at their intended level. By way of example, stopping the Sahagwan is one of the deadliest quests in the game <laughs> and is being nerfed as we speak. A whole lot of people died to that ice trap in the end. And I should know because I made it. And I also died while explaining how it works. To my wife and her friends on a rogue while jumping up and down in front of it. <laughs> Don't jump and down in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, nerfing in this case means making the quest easier, not harder. <laughs> while we are addressing obvious concerns, and I personally take the nerf bat to some of these, we may overlook some of the least popular quests due to their data being less obvious. Uh, obvious. Not a lot of people played them, not a big spike in deaths, etc. Please use this thread to point out problematic quests and areas with them uh, that are more difficult slash annoying than the rest of the similar quest in the same level range. I will personally appreciate any screenshots and any location settings. That's a slash loc, and that'll give you uh, the number of the location that you're at, which makes it a bit easier to deliver the swift near justice to the <laughs> offenders. Nerf justice, yes. Yes, the swift nerf justice. <laughs> the point here is not to make the game a cakewalk, but to smooth out the difficulty curve from quest to quest. I'm not touching most quests, just the outliers. The ones who go out of their way to kill or annoy you. Bring out your pet peeves. Flimsy. <laughs> I lo I'd love the first response. My pet peeve? Nerfy quests into the ground. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, Gums, how's it going? Uh, yeah, so uh, there was actually some... This thread, I was really, really impressed, actually, with this thread. I was figuring this thread was going to derail so hard, so fast... But this was a very interesting thread to go through. People are coming up with some really good examples and some really good suggestions of some things that need just tweaked just a bit. So oh. if, if you want to go through this thread, you might agree with a lot of the stuff because I did. Oh, uh, now this person here says one quest most people wouldn't touch. T-O-E-E -E part two. I don't know about that zug it, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to say, as, as soon as I read this, I'm like, probably was going to say he's Zagamoy, Pilot's going to say Zagamoy. No, he is. <laughs> Inevitable. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's uh, the first one that comes to my mind is Prepus and the Poison. At level, that quest is stupid hard. Well, actually, I guess I should say just the very beginning with that trap is stupid hard. Even on a rogue, it's stupid hard at level. So maybe tone down that poison trap a little bit. It, it's kind of suggestions like that that Flimsy's looking for. Or like, is there like a certain quest that you can think of that there's a certain monster that is a bit tough? Like I know later on in this thread, uh, some some people are talking about the very beginning of the uh, invitation to dinner quest when you first meet uh, Strahd and the uh, shadows and stuff come out. Some of those a bit tough. Those need to be toned down just a bit. Well, stuff like that. For me, invitation to dinner, I always think of that stupid mirror. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that, too. That's tough, too. But that's an optional, though. So 
Well, yeah, but you don't know it's an optional. Well, okay, that's true. Maybe, I maybe I, see. I, I think I always run into these. I don't know of any other way to get to the end. Oh well, I'll show you sometimes. Yeah, there's a way to get to the end without running that. But um, there's some good loot in those chests, though, so it's worth running that. But anyway, anyway, we digress. But yeah, so if you have any uh, suggestions, hop over in the thread. Like I said, I was really impressed. This thread did not like derail and just like blow up. It actually was a good thread. All right, then let's hope that some of the really, really, really outliers do actually get some attention as a result of this. Yeah, I hope so. So we'll be, it, it'll be interesting to see what uh, Flimsy does with the uh, suggestions that we're getting in this thread. But uh, so if you have any suggestions, hop in and let it know. Currently, as we record this on Monday, the 25th, this is on 11 pages. So going strong with suggestions. To Earth. Then let's head into our next section where we're going to talk about the Hardcore League Season 1, the final standings, and the after party. And based on what's coming in here, there may even be a Season 2. Spoilers! <laughs> Jeez, just like save all the good, exciting news. Just throw it right out there, Pine Leaf. Jeez. <laughs> Man, you got to learn to tease this stuff a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I, everybody knew there was going to be a season two. I mean, it was inevitable, right? But maybe there might be. We'll get to that in a second. But yeah, Accordman did post over on the forums. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated in the first Hardcore League. They have now published the final standings for both Reaper XP and Total Favor. Uh, you can click over and see that here. So if you click over uh, in the show notes, you can get a link to that. You can see all of the names that got uh, Reaper and got the uh, Favor standings. Uh, don't look for my name because I'm not on there. Yes, but I hear that somebody who was once on our show, or maybe more than once on our show, did get her name up there. That's right. Miss Lessa Ismora is on the Reaper list. So congratulations, Lessa. That is awesome. Congratulations for that. And despite having no time to run in the Hardcore League. <laughs> she found time. She did it. Lessa is yeah. amazing. Yeah. And then uh, Cordoban also says, congratulations to everyone on this list. This list is going to be published in the Hall of Heroes uh, in the future as well. So that's kind of cool. We can go into the Hall of Heroes and see all these amazing people's names. Uh, there were more than 6,000 characters who made it to level 5 and survived. Yikes. So next week's DDO Chronicle is going to be nothing but names. No, that's not what he said. Next, <laughs> next week's DDO Chronicle will be a special edition featuring everyone who survived at 5+. plus. So yeah, Chronicle pretty much next week, all names. Yeah. But it'll, it'll be interesting to see 6,000 names in the Chronicle of everybody that survived to uh, 5+. plus. Uh, they are also pleased to announce that the after party has begun. They now have reopened the Hardcore League server. You can go on, get your things in order, and transfer your characters to another server. Make sure you read the fact to get more information on that. And we have talked about this in previous shows. What's going to transfer, what won't transfer, yada, yada, yada. But go ahead and check out the fact. Character transfers from the Hardcore League to any other live server can be done through the regular DDO game launcher. The timing is this. We will be keeping the Hardcore League server open through December 2nd, after which time the Hardcore server will close for a while pending some wider server work that they are planning. Once that server work is complete, we will work to get character copies re-enabled for both the Hardcore League and other live servers as well. It is not expected that character transfers will be re-enabled following December 2nd until probably early next year. So keep that in mind if you want to transfer not just from the Hardcore server, but if you want to transfer some characters off of one server to another server... You best do that before December 2nd because your window is going to close. Character transfers are going to be closed probably until early next year. And uh, to, yes. an to answer your question, yes. I, I'm pretty sure I know what you're about to say and ask. Yes. My thing that I was going to point out is that Lotro 
had the same server work done about a month ago. Bingo. Yep. Yep. And we are... And Lotro is still waiting to reopen transfers on there. And we don't know how long that's going to take. That could also be till next year, maybe, or... I specifically yes. asked Cordovan last night uh, before yeah. uh, we were on the D&D night DDO stream. And uh, before the stream, uh, I asked him, is this the same work that you did over on Lotro? And he said, basically, yes. Okay. I, I suspect that DDO was eventually going to get that Yeah, work. and Gums King is saying it's likely the, the database update similar to Lotro. You are correct, it is. So that is what's going on there. So if you're familiar with what happened over on the Lotro side, I'm assuming it's going to be about the same way over here. Uh, but then the yep. interesting part, Cordovan wraps it up. Taking part and watching the first Hardcore League has been great, and we hope you've all had a good time too. Stay tuned for more information about Season 2 of the Hardcore League in early 2020. Ooh. So there you go. Season 2 news coming in 2020. Now, I know a lot of people said, wait, Season 2, early 2020, that is too soon, way too soon. No, news of the Hardcore League Season 2 is coming in early 2020. Okay. That's, yeah, I don't think he meant the Hardcore League Season 2 is going to start in early 2020. Just information about Season 2. Don't have to panic. Plenty of time. My assumption, I mean, I would just assume the timing of it would probably work out to be about the same as it would, would be this year, I would think. But I don't know. I mean, maybe not. Maybe they'll do it during the summer this time or something. I mean, uh, who knows? Who knows what SSG has cooked up? But yes, there more than likely is going to be a season two, which I said should not really be a shock to anybody, really, because of how popular this was. Uh, right. the, the, the devs themselves even said they were uh, very pr uh, surprised and uh, excitedly surprised at how well the players took to this and how many people played it. And so it was pretty much a given we were going to get a season two. Well, you had 6,000 people who played at least a level five. Right, exactly. So, of course, you know, that's not 6,000 people. That could be... 6,000 you know, characters, yes. Yes, 6,000 characters. But still, that's even if you break it down to, let's say, you know, we'll just round it out and do the math. Okay, let's say maybe three characters per person. That's still 6,000 people. That's still a lot of people playing on the hardcore server. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know anything. I don't know any numbers. I'm just throwing that number out there. It's just a roundabout guess. Uh, my guess is we're probably never, ever going to get to see actual numbers because that's just not what SSG does. Much to my chagrin, I always try to get numbers out of them, and I never do. <laughs> I tried. I, I even tried a Gen Con when I had Sev in a bar. I thought it was the perfect opportunity. <laughs> uh, still no numbers from him. So uh, I tried, though. I tried, folks. I tried. So, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I I mean, uh, we, we knew it was coming. Am I super excited about it? Mm, eh, maybe. I don't know. Well, we'll, we'll see. I, I don't see myself jumping in and doing it again. I might. I mean, I, I don't know. It just depends. Like It, what... it can get frustrating. With the goal, with you having to get to, I think, either was it a certain amount of favor or mm -hmm. to level 20 in order to... Yeah. In order to have anything substantial, basically like, it was five thousand favor. Yeah, five thousand favor, which I saw is an unlikely thing for me to reach. And the other goals, I believe, level twenty, which is even more. Now, the one of total favor is that the the which that, I'm sorry. Yeah, is the listing on the total favor there? That's everybody who hit five thousand. It looks like. Uh, you, well, that's just if you basically you had to hit five thousand or above to even make it on the favorite leaderboards. Okay. So there's probably X amount of people that are at five thousand are just under five thousand seven, which is where the leaderboard kicks in. So I feel sorry for the person that had five thousand six. <laughs> <laughs> just missed it by that much. 
Dude's probably like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make the leader. Oh, man, missed it by one. That'd be oh. horrible. That poor guy. Who, Whoever that guy is, you are the true VIP of the hardcore server. The 5,006 favorite guy that missed <laughs> the level by that much. Oh, well, <laughs> that's, that's sort of the tricky thing on the, on the whole thing. That's right. So, yeah, so go check that out. Check out all the names. Uh, there's a lot of names on there. Congratulations to all those people. And season two coming soon at some point in 2020. Early 2020, we'll get information and news on season two. Then uh, let's head into our Dio Chronicle issue 360, where on the top we have some gnolls that apparently are in the gnoll cave in the Borderlands, I think. Shocking! We have a yes. Borderlands cover on the Chronicle. Who would have thought? Me. I thought it because I said it was going to happen. Anyway, in the community spotlight... Uh, Hardcore League wrapped up. We just talked about that. Yeah. Uh, po- point Blank Range with Akio is the newest streamer over on DDO Stream. So check out the first show that he ran and join him every Monday starting at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. So that is an early stream on a Monday. So if you happen to be home or you happen to be in a different time zone, check him out. Also, uh, Kimmy is doing a video series teaching you how to run Kenneth Challenges. Click over and check out the video he made for Picture Portals. That means I think you you select it and then you die, right? That's, that's how it goes. Oh, Lessa <laughs> is face palming right now. Wherever Lessa's at listening to this, she's face palming that you just said that. You know what's going to happen now. Lessa's going to drag you through Kenneth Challenges. You know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> It'll happen. Oh well, e- 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 either Les or Kimmy will just try me. One of them. One, one of them. Yes. <laughs> we'll see. I'll I'll have to get in touch with this Kimmy and say, "Hey, got a I got a real challenge for you." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just saying. <laughs> in the player spotlight of Hardcore, I just threw Pine Leaf under the bus. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, in the player spotlight this week, uh, we have been sent several suggestions to highlight uh, Nimnion or- Orliet of Orion. Sure, why not? In the spot. So let's dedicate to this week's player spotlight to him. He recently put together a series of videos about the attack on Storm Reef's quest chain, and he was recently named Guild Leader of the Arcane Alliance over on uh, Orion, or Ryan, however you want to pronounce it. Keep up the great work, Nimnion. So congratulations on the player spotlight. Let's jump into the fan site news section of our Chronicle. GDO Cast had an episode last week, part one of their Hardcore League post-mortem. Love that name. <laughs> we got a shout out for our uh, episode last week. DDO Stream, of course, is a great place to find live streaming uh, DDO. Check out recent streams by Fridays on Ice, Alex and Lynn, and DDOPL. Also over on YouTube, quite a bit of people are making uh, videos as well. Uh, Crusader Betrays Friends. Alex goes through the patch notes, and Shaka shows off a total chaos optional, uh, and more. So check out Twitch and YouTube for all of the great people that are streaming and making DDO videos. We have a Chronicle comment this week. What magical DDO weapon property would be particularly useful in a real-life kitchen? In a real-life kitchen? I try to think of my weapon properties, and first thing i could think of is the one that that when it damages something gives you life in return that way if you've got a cut from earlier in your cooking or something it'll heal your wounds oh okay there you go uh the obvious choice i had was either flaming searing or blazing yeah because then you just like if you cook on the steak you just like flip your sword out got the fire on it done steak is ready well, the one you don't, I don't know want. How long it takes it? <laughs> I would say probably pretty instantaneous. See, it's it it's like an instapot, but only better. Well, I yeah, but I I heard that if you get the temperature up too high, you wind up burning it instead of cooking it. Ah, uh, see, Pine Leaf logic again. <laughs> <sighs> 
So what were you about to say? Uh, the one that you do not want would be Vorpal. <laughs> that would be bad. Very, very bad. Very bad. Because you you think it's bad enough when you're in the kitchen and you're cutting stuff and you cut your finger. Imagine if you had a Vorpal blade. <laughs> you would have no finger left at all. You'd be like, where'd my finger go? Oh. Yeah. Oh, wrong okay. time to roll a 20, yes. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, oh, I don't have a finger anymore. That's kind of nice. So there you go. We do have our screen she out of the week, and that is a Ross takes a trip with his new partner in the 441st DDO screenshot of the week. Thanks, Aras, for sending in that screenshot. Uh, he is on a horse in the Borderlands Wilderness. What which the, I'm trying to think, is the horse fording the river or is the horse swimming? Uh, probably a little of both. Yeah, which is interesting here because in Lotro, if you get a horse that's low enough in the river to need to swim you get dismounted instantly and the horse disappears yeah that's i was kind of curious because i know on um beta i tried that when it was like the first build when the, the first time they bring ho horses out i tried that and that was the first thing i tried is i went in water to see, see if you got dismounted and nope i mean i was even totally like underwater all the way and swimming underwater <laughs> And the horse was swimming, so you can swim with your horse, folks. I don't know how. I mean, mine is not to judge how a horse breathes underwater. Yeah, because as far as I know, horses typically try to keep their heads above water when they swim. Apparently, the horses in DDL like swimming. It's a valid choice for them. Maybe you that's how like they get exercise. Water? Yeah, it's fine, you know. I guess I've... It gives all new thoughts about the... There's this island in the Chesapeake Bay where I think they have this annual thing where they take the horses from... I think they're breeding ground from one, on one island to another island. <laughs> so, I could, so I would presume those horses have to swim, but... I well, that would be water. way more interesting if they would go under the water. Yes, <laughs> All right, then let's head to our store sales. And there, is there anything good for sale this week? There is. It is the Adventure and Advance sale. 25% off select Adventure Packs, Quest XP Elixirs. That is through November the 28th uh, for the astute among you. Uh, that would be Thanksgiving Day. At least here in America, I should say the right. U.S. Thanksgiving. Black Friday. Is another U.S. type holiday, I guess. And it's not really a holiday, but it's pseudo holiday, I guess. I'll say. Well, yes, but I believe that we have gifted that to the rest of the world since then. <laughs> we have, yes. So <laughs> Black Friday sales are coming. Those are going to be announced uh, late Wednesday. So after this podcast is released. Uh, so I might do a post over on the site about them. If for somehow you, you miss them, so look for that. But yes, new sales are coming Wednesday the 27th. Black Friday specials included. But this week, Select Adventure Packs, Quest XP Elixirs through the 28th. So you have a couple more days to jump in on that. Uh, the free coupon is a pretty amazing free sample, which I don't believe we've ever had as a free sample before. That will get you a free Call of Destiny Elixir. Use the coupon code Destiny Calls. That is also through November the 28th. So I have what to... Does a, what's that? What does a Call of Destiny Elixir do? That will... a That is a potion you will drink that is, is going to allow your character to earn experience in one epic destiny while you're active in another epic destiny okay. so normally when you're in epic destinies you can only earn the experience in that destiny that, that you're in but with this potion it's going to allow you for up to three hours you can earn experience in another destiny while you're playing in another destiny okay so it's kind of nice but you got to remember you, you have to have unlock the appropriate epic destiny before you can get an experience in it you just can't pick one random at say i want to end that one that's way over there that i'm not even close to no it doesn't work that way okay. you have to you, you have to have it unlocked and then you will select which one that, that you want to earn so and i think they last 
three hours. So after you drink the potion, I think it lasts for three hours. So is that real time or dungeon time? Uh, game time. Okay. So and and it's not like uh it. I can't remember if that's one that pauses when you're in public area. I think it's just three hours real time. That's one of those that just the clock ticks. And once it's done, it's done. So you might want to like plan accordingly before you drink it to where you know, okay, I'm going to, you know, quest at least for an hour here. And then when, when, once you log out, I think it pauses when you log out. And then when, when you log back in, you'll still have like another hour or whatever. So I, I haven't actually used one because I've never bought one, but I'm going to like get this free sample and check this out. So I'll see if I'm right, but I'm pretty sure that actually pauses when you're logged out. But other than that, when, when you're in-game, the clock is a ticket. Then let's head on to see what's coming in from the dungeon. And it looks like it's Arken, the Cruel, that's coming in from the dungeon, and he looks nasty. Uh, yes, this is part of WizKids' uh, newest minis, uh, part of their Icons of the Realm minis that they're doing. Uh, it is the Descent into Avernus, Archon the Cruel, and the Dark Order figure pack. Uh, this, of course, is featuring Joe Mag... Mag- God, I can never say his name. I can say it until I try to say it on a podcast, and then I can't <laughs> say his name. Joe Magna... Whatever. You know who I'm talking about. I... I don't understand why that happens. Every time I get in front of a mic and I try to say his name, I can't say it. But then if I'm not doing a podcast, I can say that name like it was my own name. It's crazy that I can't. But anyway, you know who he is. And yellow? It's like Magnanello. Magnanello. I don't know. Anyway. It's Joe. You know him. Cool guy. <laughs> Plays DDO. You know who he is. You know who we're talking about. His character, Archon the Cruel. Uh, and his followers are going to release in this mini set uh, in March of 2020. Uh, the his character Archon the Cruel has made appearances in many different shows, including Critical Role, Force Gray, and most recently uh, in the role playing adventure for Descent into Avernus. He's actually in the book. Well, his characters, of course. Okay. Uh, these miniatures were designed by himself alongside of the team at WizKids to be used with uh, any D and D campaign. Six figures are going to be in this set, including including his Dragonborn Paladin. Archon the Cruel, his bodyguard, Togar Steelfist, Death Cleric Krull, and one of Archon's Berserkers, a White Abishai. And of course, his pet Manticore, Chango. This set's going to re- retail at $39.99. Once again, look for it March 2020. Keep in mind, these are unpainted. Uh, the one that I have in the post is the one that somebody had painted. Amazing looking. And I love how they actually have him have the hand of Vecna on, which is amazing that they included that little aspect of it. Because if you're not watching Critical Role or, I guess, spoiler, a little too late, uh, the end of one of the Critical Role seasons, uh, Archon the Cruel actually got the hand of Vecna. And I'm jealous. Now, I find it a little strange that you have a paladin called Arkan the Cruel. <laughs> He's an Oathbreaker Paladin. Oh, an Oathbreaker Paladin. Yes. Okay. Now it makes a whole. Lot of <laughs> sense. Say, now, now it's making a lot of sense to you. Yeah, he's an Oath Oathbreaker Paladin. You you got to remember, is I've come from D D very old school days where there was well, I will say that the people at. TSR definitely would not have recognized a, an Oathbreaker Paladin. <laughs> right, yep. Oh, how the tables have turned, as they say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then let's go and see what's on the tabletop. Where the King of Tokyo Dark Edition, Dark Edition Limited Edition is coming from Yellow, and 
dark edition, limited edition? It's dark, Pine Leaf. It's very, very dark. Dark. <laughs> yes, Yellow did announce King of Tokyo Dark Edition is going to come in the first quarter of 2020. It's the classic tabletop brawl. Brawl. It's going to get an all new look, upgraded components, and new gameplay mechanic. King of Tokyo Dark Edition is going to be a limited edition run with only one, I repeat, one print run. So when it sells out, it sells out. Uh, Yellow says this is going to be a showcase a showcase piece for your board game collection. It's going to feature an embossed cover with upgraded components and a carefully new selected varnish. Which I'm curious on the varnish. Because varnish is usually something you put on wood, correct? It's so, why I'm most associated with I think I might have heard it on other things. But so uh, apparently they're going to put varnish on the components. Which I do know, but yes, this is a special collector's edition of Richard Garfield's King of Tokyo. Players are going to experience the dark side of giant monster battling. The backdrop for their bottle, their battles Tokyo is more wicked than ever. And this more wicked edition features an all new mechanic, which they didn't say what it was yet. King of Tokyo Dark Edition is for two to six players, ages eight and up. Plays in about 30 minutes. Uh, retail is going to be $49.99. And so far, as far as I know, and I've reached out to my rep at Yellow for clarification on this, and I haven't heard back yet. This is only going to be sold directly from Yellow, from what I can tell. I've looked in all the obvious places. And, uh, i.e., like, miniature markets, cool stuff. They do not have it listed. Amazon does not have it listed. So either it's not listed anywhere else yet, or it's only going to be sold directly from Yellow. Not sure which. As I said, I've reached out to my rep. Haven't heard back. But it's pretty interesting. Limited edition run. I, they didn't say how many were in the edition, but they're only going to do one print run. So I'm guessing you're going to see this after the fact on eBay for stupid, stupid prices. Most likely. And I hate that. I hate when people do that with a passion. That is one of my biggest pet peeves in the board game hobby, that people do that. Our people go on and will kickstart a game and get all the kickstart exclusives and then put it up on ebay for like five times the amount of money and then people actually buy it because they didn't do the it just oh that burns me so bad i just that is my my biggest pet peeve in in this hobby is people that do that yeah i mean i guess supply and demand is what most people would say but it's just it's just wrong but you know what are you gonna do anyway fortunately people have been doing that with all sorts of things for well, as long yeah, as there's been a mercantile I, system. That, that is very true. It's it's not just board games that it happened in, but it's just I just notice it a lot in board games and I'm just like, no, don't don't pay no, don't pay that much money for that. But uh exactly. this is kinda interesting though. One print run. And now, here's, Oh, go ahead. I'm just wondering you have this genre where you have these big monsters battling mm -hmm. out each other destroying mm -hmm. the city in as collateral damage all the way through and they're saying oh yeah and now let's see the dark side of that <laughs> that's right oh uh, yeah it's from the couple pictures that they have shown off uh, you you can kind of see it from the cover of the game the box which uh i do want to point out the picture that's on the screen right now if you're watching the youtube version of this uh and the one that i have over on the site is not the final version of the box they pretty much said that's about what it's going to look like but you can kind of see what they mean by dark everything is going to have like a dark theme to it uh i don't know i'm excited for this i think i'm going to try to get one of these because i love king of tokyo I think it would just be awesome to have this limited edition thing. Um, I'm going to try to get it at the $50 MSRP, though. I'm not going to pay stupid eBay prices for it. Anyway, yeah, the, the monster on the top there looks like Wolfzilla. <laughs> well, kind of, a little bit. So hopefully, uh, if I do manage to actually 
get this because they didn't say what the print run was going to be. Just there was just going to be one. Uh, we'll do like an unboxing and whatever on it if I can actually purchase one of these. But we'll see. We'll see. But that is uh, King of Tokyo Dark Edition coming from Yellow. And next we have something that I'm sure you've always wanted to do that you can to play Ticket with Ride with She Who Must Not Be Named. That's right, and I forgot to mute mine, so yes, I'm not going to say the name because I was going to mute mine so I could say the name, and then I didn't do it. So as I'm staring at it right now, yes. You know that Amazon Echo device? And she has a name? Uh, if you ever wanted to play Ticket to Ride with her, now's your chance. Amazon and Days of Wonder are changing how players experience board games by introducing the uh, first official she who not no be named skill for ticket to ride and ticket to ride europe for free uh the move hopes to welcome new players aboard the award-winning game by alan r moon of course and act as conductors i see what they did there for in even more experienced rail riders uh the these skills will replace the rule book by taking players on a guided experience of the game and offering the option to use it as an additional player so if you want to play Ticket to Ride solo, you can play it solo with your Amazon Echo and she who not shall be named named. Well, maybe I would just want to use the run the app instead and not worry about someone who must not be named. Kind of. Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. This kind of didn't make sense to me because I'm like, just use the app and do it. But anyway. <laughs> Maybe this will get some new people into the hobby because Ticket to Ride is kind of one of those gateway games. Anyway, it's not. It technically, and I'm using, I don't know why I'm actually physically using air quotes here because nobody can see me because this is a podcast. But I actually really did do air quotes there. Uh, <laughs> it's technically a hobby game, but it's kind of one of those that straddles the line where it's almost a mass market game at this point because you can walk into pretty much any store and find this. Like any Walmart, any Target, uh, any Kmart, if you still have one of those, those which Kmarts are pretty much going away. But uh, we have a couple other regional stores around here uh, that I can go into and they sell tickets to ride. Uh, I've seen other places uh, like Bed Bath & Beyond. I've seen it in there even. Bed Bath & Beyond? Yeah, they have a small game section. Usually right, right around Christmas. Uh, oh, they don't have many games, but it's usually right around about this time. Uh, I've seen it in there. I've seen it. Uh, I'm not sure how widespread uh, store Kohl's is, but I've seen it in Kohl's too. So like I said, technically Ticket to Ride is a hobby game, but it's almost a mass market game. But it's kind of one of those really good gateway games because if you can get somebody that is not a board gamer to play Ticket to Ride with you, I bet you you could probably get them to play something else. It's one of those good games. So maybe... This might get some people in, like if they have an Echo, and they're like, oh, well, I have the Echo, let me get this game, and let's see what this is about, and then you can use your Echo, maybe that'll get people in, but I, I don't know. I'm not jumping up and down about this personally, but, I mean, <laughs> I do love Ticket to Ride. I might try this. I mean, I might as well, I guess, give it a shot and see how it plays. I'd be interested to see how it actually nice. would play, yeah, because... If you know how to play Ticket to Ride, you're going to have to draw the route cards for her, I would think. So I'm not sure how that's going to work. And I'm sure you're going to have to say, okay, the route you're trying to build is, you know, like Duluth to Omaha or whatever. Right. So you would know what, and that kind of defeats some of the purposes. So I would, I'm going to have to try this just to see. I'll just have to get the the skill from my Echo and and, and just try this to see. Because I'm curious to see how this plays. Uh, I I mean, I guess it's kind of cool. She teaches you the rules and everything like that if you don't want to read the book. Okay, that's that's fine. Uh, I'm more interested to just see how it would work just playing it with the Amazon Echo. Because as I said, you're kind of defeating the purpose of Ticket to Ride because you're going to give away what you're doing. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know. It's weird. I Kind of want to check this out, though, just to see how it plays. So I will try to do that and report back. Then let's head into our week in gaming. (laughs) 
And Drek, what were you up to? Well, played some DDO with you. I will let you talk about what we did. Uh, played a bunch of D&D 5e. We did the 18th episode of Waterdeep Dragon Heist. That show is now uh, live. I will actually uh, link that in the show notes so you can check that episode. Uh, we are in um, the Lair of the Beholder. We are crazily taking on a beholder's lair because why wouldn't we not do that i mean because you're crazy why yeah and then also we did the heroes of battle rise that's the out of the abyss campaign that was episode six still in the abyss uh we met uh demi gorgon so that was fun oh, fun ish uh, we <laughs> ran away from demi gorgon but it was fun ish surprise um yeah yeah so you can see see that uh strange things are afoot with that uh i don't want to spoil too much i guess i kind of spoiled that where we met demi gorgon but okay minor spoilers if you haven't watched that yet but uh if you are watching the show you knew what was coming it was pretty much hinted at the episode before what was coming so so minor spoiler i guess uh, and then uh, video game wise uh started playing seven days to die again been a long, long time since I played Seven Days to Die. There's been a couple updates since I played. Uh, the new uh, Unstable update is out, and a lot of things changed, and there were some new mods that came out for that. So we decided to be crazy and combined an Unstable build with Unstable mods to see what happens. <laughs> so there you go. So yeah, our server's back up. And of course that, uh, you know, playing with Cad and Lessa and Saba and Mithri and Tay and Rent and Lessa. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Like I said, it's unstable. So at any moment, all of the work we've done could be for naught because it's all going to crash and we have to start all over. But that's kind of the fun of it in a way. <laughs> uh, we're coming up on our first seven day horde. We're actually almost to the seventh day, uh, so we're trying to decide uh, the best course of action on that because uh, we are ill prepared, as they say, for that horde. Because uh, you know we just started, uh, we really have nothing at all built up, hardly at all yet. So so far, the consensus is uh, I'm I actually chose um, the mods that we're using. You, you can choose classes. Uh, this time, I chose the mechanic mod, which I've never done. So I actually got all the schematics and everything to actually build mini bikes, and we managed to scrounge up the stuff that we need. And with uh, Ren's help and uh, Cad's help, we managed to get some stuff, and they kind of used the skills that that they had and they they could craft the stuff we needed i actually made a mini bike so we have a mini bike so so far the consensus to how to survive this first horde night is going to be i'm going to get on a mini bike and i'm going to drive around and just have the hordes of zombies chase me until the horde is done so we'll see if i survive that um i am going to take video of that i think because that should be a fun interesting challenge to be chased by God knows number of zombies. Because uh, basically I'll be the only one on the server. So all the zombies are going to come to me. And then I'm going to get on on the motorcycle. And I'm just going to ride them as far away from our base that we're starting to set up as possible. So we'll see uh, if this crazy plan works. Uh, next week I'll report if I died horribly. Uh, which <laughs> maybe might happen. I don't know. We'll see should be fun uh i'm pretty sure that's that's how we're gonna do that horde and then uh the next horde day at day 14 we'll actually fight because we'll be ready by then uh we were just not prepared on this one uh plus the the map we're on this time is huge it is like the biggest world map seed that we have played on and we were totally all separated when we started so and some of us are still separated so we're all not together yet um so that's another reason why we're not quite quite prepared for the sword but we'll see how that goes uh wish me luck uh without sacrificing my life but we'll see we'll see how that goes yeah. <laughs> um, and that's really basically it. Uh, so you can tell them what we did. And then I uh, see you did a bunch of stuff. Holy cow. Well, that's because we had, I have two weeks here. 
Oh, that's right. I forgot. You were not on last week's episode. That is correct. Right, because you must have done it at some weird time or something like I that. I did. It, it, well, it wasn't that weird of a time, but uh, you may have been recording another podcast at the time I was recording that podcast. <laughs> so you probably couldn't have been in two places at once. So that might have been a little problematic. Oh. Or if not, you might have got really confused and you might have started talking about something and people on Lotro were like, what? <laughs> what is that? Yeah, there's a word of the Borderlands. Yes. <laughs> right, exactly. Where's this Borderlands? I want to see this. You know, we'll begin with my Dragonborn Artificer, who first got lost in the swamp, then found the end of the road. Then after that, finishing the Druid stuff with the end of the road. But actually, no, that's the Netherese chain with the with all those scroll pieces you're looking for. That's So we got to the end of the road. Then I decided to go into the Demon's Den in the Inspired Quarter and... Well, that sounds like a fun place to go into. Yes, in the demon's den. So I reached the ritual room. You know the ritual room where you have... A Merilith? Yes, well... That ritual room? Yes, that ritual (laughs) room there. Of course, the first time you get in there, it's it's a bunch of underlings that she had spawned in. Mm -hmm. Yep. And let's just say a soloing ranged character is not the ideal character to take into this fight. I cannot believe you even attempted to do that by yourself. Kudos to you for even attempting that. So I went in there, of course, it got pounded. So I came back in. Actually, I didn't get back in time, so I think I wound up up resetting it. So I go back in there and trying it again and... This time I managed to survive in there, but really... Actually, I might have gotten killed another time, but this time I had the respawn point at a close enough point that I was able to get back in time. And eventually, I managed to go and finish that dungeon. I can't believe I managed it, but I did. But yes, you're right. With Since you know that I've never been known to be able to find a nice, optimal spec shall we say that Mm -hmm. really makes me powerful and soloing on a ranged on on an artificer and yeah that's a tough dungeon after that i decided to try i must have been a masochist and decided to do this the shipwrecked spy you are just like what who who are you and what have you done with finally yes now Staying alive in the shipwreck spy seems to be easy enough. Is keeping that captain alive? Because that captain seems to always go on the other side of the map, and I don't know about that the captain's surrounded and being hit by mobs until it's too late. So I tried it twice. The captain died both times, and it does not help at all that I cannot target the captain in order to try to heal or anything like that. It's like... I tried to target the captain, but there are always so many bobs around the captain whenever the captain's in trouble that, you know, sorry, I'll, I'll never click on the captain in order to be able to do a heal or anything like that. So I, I just decided, all right, I'll hang it up at that point. So I went back to the Inspired Quarter and ran the Dream Conspiracy. Finding the path, I dream of Jeets, then the Mind Sunder. And while running the Mind Sunder, I learned something very, very important. That there's actually a legitimate reason to take inflict damage as a spell. In fact, when I did eventually finish this, and I finished this just bare, I was at the slightest amount of health left when I finally broke the mind center. Nice. I believe I died half a second after it. So I completed the dungeon. I didn't get any loot out of it because I died (laughs) afterwards. You you completed it, though. But I got credit for completing the dungeon in there. And I leveled up to 19. And when I leveled up to 19, I decided, all right, I'm taking inflict damage. Because I'm sure th- destroying that nine, nine center would be 100 times easier if you're using a spell that's specifically designed to destroy things like that. As opposed to shooting it with a crossbow where every single type of auxiliary damage I'm putting out, it's immune to. 
So it's just like, okay, you do this little bit of damage, you do this little bit of damage, you do this little bit of damage, and I got all these miles pounding on me at the same time. So yeah, it was, it was, and you can't get rid of the miles because they just respawn. So yes, I got through that one through the in the worst way because, yeah, I didn't have inflict damage. And my suggestion is, if you ever do the mind sunder and you got an inflict damage spell, have that spell in there. When I say inflict damage, I mean the is that what you call it? That yeah, inflict damage, right? Yeah, because it's for the construct when it goes against constructs. Yep. Yeah. yep. yeah, that's that, that's inflict damage. I think I think that maybe force will work, but yeah, just about any other type of damage is useless. But I managed to get through that. Now, after reaching 19, I decided, well, is it possible to run Epic Keep of the Borderlands with a level 19 character? Should be. And I found out that you're not allowed to. Really? It did not. I tried it. It did not give me the option to run the Epic version. It only would allow me to run the Heroic version. Ooh, I bet you have to be tw I bet they have it locked at 20 then. Yeah, I think it's locked at 20. Uh, okay. So I need to get one more level then. Let's see. Yes, I was hoping to be able to do it because this is the character that I'm trying to get to level 20 by the end of the year. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I, I was trying to figure out why you were doing all this stuff, but okay, now it makes sense. Yeah, like I said, now I got to figure out, all right, what do I do at level 19? It looks like it, the only place I could think of right now is the Stormhorn. So it sounds like a trip to the Stormhorn. Yep, that now. would be about your best bet. Yeah. I would say. Then I took a gnome artificer and ran the bugbear banners, who at your step and violent delights. And what I noticed while running in the borderlands was something very, very unusual. My dog kept up with me all throughout it. All right, I think I once went across a bridge. I went across, I forded a stream or something like that that gave it trouble. But outside of that, it was following me all over the place. I have known no other location in the game where my dog behaves. And that's your arty dog as well. Yeah, what, my arty dog. What you're talking about. Okay, yeah. Yeah, my I dragonborn. Figured that's what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah my dragonborn arty dog, it, it constantly gets stuck places no matter what. You, would, I could be on a flat featureless plane and that thing was going to get stuck. <laughs> nice. In the borderlands, I'm going through mountains, I'm going through hills, I'm going through over bridges, I'm doing all sorts of weird stuff, and the thing keeps up with me. <laughs> and then, of course, with you on my level 20 no warlock, I we ran the complete border. I know you went over the first half of you're talking about the first half of it with last week's show, but, right, but yeah. since I was last on, we went through the entire Borderlands, all eight quests. Whee! So at least I know what they're all like now, and that my gnome artificer has some idea what's coming up. Then in Minecraft, I ran the Mage Rages for November for three weeks three and four, and for week four. One of the items that I had to get was a prismarine slab. And I'm sorry, he's evil, isn't he? Because not only do I need a prismarine slab, but during this particular month, because he's doing some crossover stuff, he decided that there will be no borders. No, he is, normally has a board, a spherical border. Okay. Going through the area so that you're able to got an idea of how far you can go and stuff like that. But in this case, there's no border. And I had to get a prismarine slab. And getting prismarine means finding an ocean monument. Do you know how hard it is to find an ocean monument? <laughs> Probably does not sound like it'd be something that'd be simple. Well, ocean monuments are only found, as the name implies, in oceans. And of course, oceans aren't exactly known for places where you have easy visibility and all that stuff and when you got this big wide ocean you're saying okay now where do i search now there was a village and perhaps i could have tried trading up one of the cartographers to see if he would have a cartographer a map to an ocean monument maybe things okay. would faster if i'd done that but i decided oh i'm sure it would be 
I'm sure there's got to be an ocean monument that's easy to find. Otherwise, he would not have asked us to find this. Well, it, there was one, actually, I think, just to the just off in the direction I goes, I think just to the north of a coral reef. So, okay, perhaps just off the coral reef, there was one, but I didn't notice that one. So I decided, well, this can't be a very large ocean. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow the coastline and go around in a circle. And I'm sure that eventually somewhere along that route, there would be an ocean monument. And no, it was not an inland ocean. It was not a, an ocean that was surrounded by land all the way through. It was a vast monster. So, but I got some 5,000 blocks away from the starting place. And, you know, way, way, way too far for it to be what he intended. So I said, all right, I guess I'll just have to start from scratch. I will go back up. Now, most players who play Mage Rage would suicide in order to get back to home in order to do this. But I decided I'm going to try to take as much of a beeline as possible in order to get back to the location I want to to go back to my starting place and restart everything and maybe even try to trade up that village I was talking about, that villager I was talking about earlier. So I went okay. across there and said, let's take a beeline. So now I'm out in the open ocean and about halfway across, getting back home, I run into an ocean monument. No, oh, of course you did, because why would you not? All right. So this is when I run into the ocean monument and... Fortunately, this is Mage Rage. And the reason why it's important that it's Mage Rage is that in Mage Rage, you have these spells that allow you to do certain things. And one of the spells I took was Telekinesis. And when you use the Telekinesis spell, you point it at the thing, and it will dig the thing to you and bring the item into your inventory. Which meant, A, I did not have to dig. And that's very important near Ocean Monuments because... The boss of an ocean monument, whenever you get near it, decides to put this mining fatigue on you, so it will take ten times as long to mine anything as it would otherwise. So I just pointed at the thing. I didn't have to go into the water because I just pointed, and it just targeted through the water and hit the first block that wasn't water. Oh, so I nice. managed to pick it up without leaving my boat. <laughs> That's amazing. Then I went to an island, made my crazy prison ring slab, and finished the thing. <sighs> <laughs> That's amazing. So, yeah, that was crazy. Then on tabletop, I ran the Tomb of Annihilation Adventure number nine, which was Ross Nice. Then I ran an, a, a, game, a new game called Renegade. Actually, it's not a new, it's a new game for me, Renegade. And I just ran the training simulation on that. So I ran, right, so I ran the training session, all got that started on there. And let's see how that... So may, I need to get back to that see how some of the other actual runs go onto that. In this case, this is a cyberpunk-type game where where you are trying to try to undermine the system on there, undermine whatever the system that you're fighting against in there, and you've got to do that before either A, time runs out, or... B before it does something really nasty to you. So then I played Dizzle and I played each of the four levels that come with it once. Dizzle is a is a dice game. It's a roll and write game, pretty much is how to describe that. Then I decided to try Elder Sign. I hadn't played that in a while. And I decided to try Patrice Hathaway. In fact, I just I did random ones. So I randomly I, I selected Patrice Hathaway as my investigator. And ye to still as my as my big boss. And while running through this, I managed to have what I think was a pretty poor combination here because Patrice's ability is to get extra clues. Ye to sell's ability is that I will have to take damage whenever I use a clue. Oh jeez. And I had to very much balance taking damage and healing in that one in order to complete that one. <laughs> but, yeah, but it did not make it easy. But then we are talking about Elder Sign. <laughs> True. Yes. We currently have 15 supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to, like to, if you'd like to help support DDO players, simply go to the donations page where you can support the Players Alliance on Patreon. There you'll find rewards, including a mention on the podcast of your choice, or even be guests with us for an episode of DDO Players News. 
We actually have a featured comment. Actually, we have three comments. We do. The, lots of comments this week, which was awesome. Yes. And what did Nikola Tesla say? Hey, that was over on YouTube. Another amazing episode. Enjoyed the flow of the conversation. And that was last week's episode uh, with a uh, little chat ahead with Evil Beaker about the early TSR days. Ooh, the early TSR days. What, was he involved with TSR? Yeah, he yeah he, he worked with TSR. Okay, that helps a great deal. So he, oh, somebody didn't listen to the episode. Well, I didn't know that you actually recorded one. I didn't oh, realize oh. you recorded one until just before we started recording. Here. Oh, uh, surprise. There was an episode <laughs> last week. <laughs> okay, I missed that. And yeah. Jack on also concerning her last episode, said, Great show. Loved hearing about the bygone days of D&D and gaming from EB. Missed finally, but it's understandable. Thanks for all your work. It's understandable. All right. And what did Samuel Kaiser say? He said, uh, saw the link from the DDO Chronicle, and I plan on following regularly now. Really enjoy the podcast. So thank you. Glad Thank you, you saw the link. Always good to have new uh, listeners. Yeah, if you did not listen to the show last week, uh, it was uh, myself and Evil Beaker and the bulk of the show. Uh, we were just talking, uh, Evil Beaker and I were just talking about the days that he worked at TSR, uh, the products he worked on uh, at TSR, and just some of the you know little fun TSR stories. So if you like the uh, early days of uh, D&D and TSR and you want to hear some behind-the-scenes stuff, uh, go back and listen to that episode if you haven't listened to it yet. Yes, and while we received three featured comments this week, we did not receive any emails. But if you'd like to send us one, you can send it to podcast at ddoplayers.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the Players Alliance at Players Ally, DDO Players at DDO Players, Dracula at Dracula at Score72, and Piney Fed Piney Beatles. And you can follow Drac on Twitch at Draculetta underscore 72. And that is all for the. Oh, no, no. The Players Alliance has two shows on Mondays at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. We have DDO Players News, and on Saturdays at 8.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, we have Loach Players News. You can join us for our shows at ddoplayers.com slash live. And that is all for tonight. And this is Piney Beatles reminding you. Do quest responsibly.